This is my toy Zeppelin. It's kind of a big balloon. And today we're going to be talking about lighter than air aircraft, big balloons, maybe something a bit bigger than this one if they have something like that. What is this anyways? Oh, this is a tethered aerostat that we use to monitor riverbank erosion. It's got a camera attached to it that's uh, able to take pictures from the air. And it's helium filled, so we basically fly it out and take photos from wherever we need to. It's a big balloon. Well, it's not a balloon per se. It's not like a blimp because it has the, the vein, the, the uh, fins at the back that allow it to weather vane into the wind. And that allows us to get more control of it so that we can keep it pointed in one direction. Um, but uh, in, in a lot of senses, it obviously has a lot of the same characteristics. That was used to take photographs of riverbanks and, and along the river areas. Now, why would you want to do that in this, this area part of the world? Yeah, that's, that's correct. What we primarily use it for is taking photographs of the riverbanks uh, so that we can monitor how much of the riverbanks we're losing due to ongoing erosion. And you'll know from being in parks in the city here that are along the river, when you walk out towards the river, oftentimes you can find a very steep drop off where land is basically a landslide has caused uh, soil to, to uh, fall into the river. And that, of course, results in loss of public use areas. It can actually impact roads, it can impact people's homes, it can impact walkways and pathways for cyclists. People's yeah, homes? Like people, absolutely. Yeah. Two, it was two years ago, there was a home in North. Kildonan, for example, was impacted by a riverbank failure that actually resulted in the house having to be demolished. Now, why why use a aerostat that rather than I don't know aircraft or just walking along and taking photographs from the from the ground? Well, photographs from the ground can't really give you a good perspective on what's happening uh, in terms of, of the overall you know, relationship of the riverbank to where the river is. You really need to get that bird's eye view from up above to see the, the shape and the geometry of the top of the riverbank. You can use an airplane, but it's quite expensive to do so, and it's something you have to schedule and, and you kind of fly the whole river in one go. And the problem with that is if you have a riverbank failure that occurs, you want to get out there right away to start getting photographs to see where the material has pushed up into the river. And if you don't get out quick enough, that material will start to disappear because obviously it constricts the river channel and erodes quite quickly. But that type of evidence gives us a lot of understanding as to how these riverbanks are occurring or riverbank failures are occurring. So we can take this aerostat out there, launch it within about an hour, be up in the air, taking photographs right after an event has occurred. So it's quick, get the aerostat in the air, you drive the truck out there and, and fill up the whole thing with Absolutely. helium. Absolutely, very superhero-ish. We were just out of the truck, it comes up into the air, taking photographs, into the truck it goes, and we're back in the lab doing analysis. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird! It's a plane! Now you were telling me, of course, we know the difference between aerostats and blimps, but what about Zeppelins? Uh. Now Zeppelins were very, very big, <laughs> uh, a lot bigger than this, and I mean, they could carry people. They could, and, and what was different about a Zeppelin is it had a frame inside that allowed it to distribute the weight and also to hold the, the, the large amount of volume it was carrying. So it was really a structural issue with a frame inside. This aerostat or blimps have no frame inside. Now what is your vision for, for this? Where do you think that uh, aerostats can go? What can they be used for in a, in a larger sense other than looking at riverbanks? <laughs> well actually, you know, once they start getting big, the economics improves tremendously. They're like ships in the ocean. The bigger they are, the greater volume they displace, but your, your heavy bits, the engines and the gondola and so on, don't change in size, so your actual net lift improves dramatically. So when you get big enough, past 50 tons, then you can start carrying freight commercially. And I see these for use in our north to serve remote communities. I see them for mining purposes, to bring out concentrates, and certainly for bringing in construction materials for housing, for, for dams, for pipeline construction, all sorts of things where we have to move freight into difficult areas. So that will be within Canada. Yeah. Then beyond Canada, once they get over 100 tons lift or 150 tons lift, and by the way, the old Zeppelins would carry 80 tons, so it's, it's not impossible to get there. Okay. Once they get beyond 150 tons lift, we'll cross oceans. And then all that freight, which is sort of not valuable enough to move by airplanes, but too perishable to move by ships, will find its way onto an airship, and one of the biggest commodities will likely be fresh fruits and vegetables. 
Now, what about uh, issues related to cost effectiveness? Like, is it worthwhile investing in this technology now rather than airplanes and helicopters? Well, there's two ways of looking at that. And one is you have to compare, you know, if we're going to the north, the only real alternative is to build all weather roads. And they're grossly expensive. It's a, a million dollars a mile for a gravel road. So it doesn't take long to pay for an airship, which would be considerably less expensive. And of course, the airship can go anywhere, not just where that road goes. So compared to roads, they're much less expensive. The other reason to invest in this technology is the environment. Uh, because they have a, a buoyant lift, you don't pay to lift the cargo, all you pay is to push it through the air, they burn less fuel and therefore have less greenhouse gases, plus alternative fuels are much easier to use in a vehicle this size because it's huge. You can have a, a low pressure large tank filled with hydrogen that would have zero emissions. Now why aren't we investing? In why don't we hear more about this? Well, principally it's a matter of business confidence. There's no technological barriers that now remain to doing this, but it's the old case of nobody wants to be first and nobody wants to be alone. So we have everybody sort of sitting with their arms folded, waiting for somebody to act and move first, but we're now starting to see that. Uh, the U.S. military is moving because they need these vehicles for surveillance, and the Marines are interested as a, a logistics uh, base. Uh, Boeing is now involved because they see an opportunity, certainly for the short haul lift and, and placement, uh, for mining, for pipelines and other things. So they're now starting to invest. Within four or five years, we will see big airships again. And then once that starts, my view is it'll be like a, a gold rush where every major aerospace company in the world will want to have an airship as well because there'll be money in it. So it's good environmentally. It makes sense from a scientific perspective, makes good sense from a business perspective. And it makes really good sense from Canada's perspective because roughly 70% of our entire territory has no roads. And we've got a big problem in the north with respect to sovereignty. How are we going to monitor the Northwest Passage uh, once that opens up to transport? And, and also, what are we going to do if there's an accident, an oil spill? How do we get people and materials in to deal with that? Uh, there's a, a very important military component to all transportation. For us in Canada and the north, this is a technology that makes the most sense in terms of its ability to go anywhere and its low cost of operations.